with the Africans in Cuba who I've encountered, what they're thinking about is representation on a different wavelength. It's not representation for the sake of just being seen. It's the politic. Are you a communist? Do you support the Cuban revolution? These are the questions that are that that they've been able to create space to ask. What is the what is the ideology here of the person and and letting that be their guide in which they determine who is a friend of the Africans in Cuba and who is an enemy of the African in, Africans in Cuba and they absolutely know who their enemies are and they are organized enough to do something about it. <laughs> Para que se asustan será pa mejor. Es el pueblo entero el que ya está gritando. Viva la revolución. Iranian nuclear weapons development. They have turned the island into a communist hellhole. The experiment in Venezuela has failed completely. I want to play one last clip from one of the videos you sent me. Beautiful video, uh, and then we'll wrap up here um, talking about your uh, experience in, in Cuba. Beautiful video, heartwarming to see uh, young children, young African girls being able to dance, being able to be supported by the government. Meanwhile, in the U.S., they're attacked by police. They are victimized, criminalized, in poverty. And here you have a state that provides programs, dancing. What is life like for young children in Cuba, for women, uh, especially young African women and Af women, African women in general? <laughs> Yeah, so I'm, a, I'm about to attempt to talk about something that I feel a lot of people in the U.S. might not be able to understand because the context of race in Cuba is just so different than what we understand here in the U.S., right? We have two countries that have, that have gone down very converging paths, paths when it comes to reconciling with their history of slavery, right, and their, and their relationship to Africa. I want to preface everything I'm about to say by saying that you said it earlier, Cuba is an African nation. They're like point blank period. There is no way around it. This is not me just going there and then seeing a bunch of people like me and being like, oh, there's a lot of black people. So it must be an African nation. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that out of the mouths of the people as professed by the state, as professed by Fidel himself, Cuban people acknowledge Africa as a part of who they are. It is a part of everything about what it means to be a Cuban in terms of the food, in terms of the music, in terms of the traditions. And unlike the United States, Cuba has gone a long way to reconcile its history with slavery in material in like material ways not just simply saying it's the original sin of our country but actually fighting right on its own land for for that for that to rectify that and fighting in Africa so cuba has a great deal of respect for africa as a place not just some like amorphous idea of like black lives matter but like we respect africa the united states does not respect africa it actually quite despises Africa. And if it could just take everything in Africa and kill all the people, it would. That is not the relationship that Cuba has to Africa on a material level. So the relationships are different, right? So when, when I talk about African people inside of, of, of uh, Cuba, you also have to understand that for a long time, that distinction doesn't even make sense to people because 
everybody's for the most part is like I like met people in Cuba who in the US would not be considered black but would tell me straight out of their mouths Africa is in me right so there's that there's there's that distinction that you have to bridge but then okay let's say we're talking about phenotype race da 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 da, da like who are the afro cubans these afro descendant people right I'm not going to sit here and profess and tell you that as um, as an African from the United States, I can tell you everything about the um, Afro descendant experience in Cuba. But what I will tell you is that they have a firm handle on their reality. They know exactly where they've come from. They know exactly what the experiences are that they've had in Cuba. And they have a very clear roadmap for where they want to go. And that experience of moving along that roadmap with support from the state is not something that I can tell you I have ever experienced as an African in the United States because my agenda is the exact um, sort of antithesis of the U.S. agenda. What I want, what would what, what, what would sustain me, what would make me happy, what would make me free is a direct threat to the existence of the United States. So the relationship for a lot of people, it will not click. Even what I'm saying right now, there's somebody that's gonna watch this as like an Afro pessimist or something like that, that's gonna be like, ah, oh, anti-blackness is global and you're just trying to ignore the signs and you don't wanna hear the truth. And it's like, no, you're, you, just, you just can't understand love. I'm sorry, it, it's not gonna connect in, in your brain, right? In that video that you just saw, those young girls they look like my little cousins but they're free like they're they are they're they're free children they're free to the extent that you know living in a country that's being blockaded from the entire world like that as much as that can exist right and when the united states takes its boot off of cuba they're going to be even more they're going to be um they're going to be even more free i had the opportunity to meet some brilliant brilliant um afro descendant people in Cuba who represented the Yoruba face, they represented queer Christians, they represented black journalists. Um, and their understanding of the society that they're in is almost as if they kind of feel like, not even kind of, they feel bad for me as the African from the United States. Does that make sense? They're like, like their frame of reference for understanding me in a lot of ways is like George Floyd, police brutality, um, you know, all like all these really fucked up things that are related to the African experience um, in the U.S. But while I was in while I was in Cuba, I got to see and taste a little bit of what it's like to exist in a society where, on a structural, like on a systemic level, African people are respected. Now I say structural and systemic because the Afro pessimists are going to watch this and they're going to be like, you're lying. So there's no racist in Cuba. And that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that racist attitudes and structural racism are two completely different things, right? And so when you talk about um, representation here in the US, for example, we went on a bunch of tours and we went to a bunch of places and we ended up having a conversation um, where an African from the US asked like, basically, I don't see enough black people in positions of power. And when is Cuba going to have a black president? And an Afro descendant Cuban got up behind him on the mic and started going off. <laughs> he was like, First of all, we are represented everywhere in every in, in every level of Cuban society. But also this question of representation that you ask, I beg you to be more cautious because remember Batista, remember Batista, remember Batista, right? Because if people understand the history, Batista was lauded at the time as a person of color that was in charge of the country. And he was a straight up op. He was a straight mm. up arc. He was running Cuba into the ground, like uh, sugar, casino, plantation, didn't give a fuck about the people of color or the African people in Cuba. And so what the Cuban, what the Cuban, what, what the Africans and Cuba who I've encountered, what they're thinking about is representation on a different wavelength. It's not representation for the sake of just being seen. It's the politic. Are you a communist? Do you support the Cuban revolution? These are the questions that are that that they've been able to create space to ask. What is the what is the ideology here of the person and, and letting that be their guide in which they determine 
who is a friend of the Africans in Cuba and who is an enemy of the African in, Africans in Cuba. And they absolutely know who their enemies are and they are organized enough to do something about it. A huge lesson that Africans in the U.S. could learn as opposed to letting ourselves be used to push the um, anti-revolutionary agenda in Cuba, we should learn what it means to properly understand who your enemies are and move accordingly. Beautifully said. I think that's something that's very powerful. And by the way, the person who we're looking at on the screen, for those of you who are listening, is one of the highest ranking, most respected revolutionaries of the Cuban Revolution, Juan Almeida Bosque, who was born in 1927 and sadly passed away in 2009. He's one of the OGs of the Cuban Revolution from beginning to end. He's somebody who was there with Fidel, with Che, with, Ever with Raul, on Granma, everything. He saw everything, eventually uh, joining the Cuban Communist Party, overseeing the development, overseeing also the, the solidarity brigades to the continent of Africa, to Angola, to Mozambique. It's somebody who has commented about the necessity of the Cuban revolution supporting African revolutionaries in their struggle against settler colonialism and imperialism, and somebody who stayed and played a very important role in Cuba up until his death in 2009. So, and he, by the way, Juan Almeida Bosque was honored with the title Hero of the Republic of Cuba, one of the highest titles, and the Order of Maximo Gomez. So he's somebody that is very highly revered. And also Antonio Maceo, who is an Afro-Cuban who fought against the Spanish colonizers as well. So the Cuban government does recognize and is part and parcel. Africans are part of the Cuban revolution. And just because a president or one particular person that we are only seeing in media is not African, that doesn't mean that the base of the Cuban revolution is not African because without African revolution, there is no Cuban revolution. And I think that's something that the Cuban people understand. They are the revolution. Uh, they are the revolution, exactly. And and I think, uh, as Comrade Salifu pointed out, um, they're one and the same, and I, you can't understand one without the other. And it's important also to be aware of that because a lot of the propaganda, I don't know if you saw, by the way, Comrade, uh, the, the Latin Grammys, the fucking bullshit nonsense, how this group, uh, Gente de Sona, and the people who were supported by the USCID, um, the the San, San Isidro movement, uh, hip hop. So now they're trying to use African people to use Black Lives Matter, to use Patria y Vida, to try to like brand this as an anti-racist movement against the Cuban revolution. I even saw some people say something like uh, Black Lives Matter in Cuba uh, and the dictatorship. Like they're trying to blend this. So your kind of final thoughts on all that. Yeah, I mean, this is this this is the thing. This is the thing that I that this this is the thing that I will say about all of that because we did we were able to get some updates on what was happening at the Latin Grammys while we were there. We didn't have lots of internet access as like internationals who didn't have SIM cards or whatever. So also clarifying a lot of that the government, the uh, Jim Paskey, the stupid, the orange hair lady, <laughs> the bride of Chucky. Exactly, the bride of Chucky <laughs> talking about how the Cuban government be cutting off the internet. Nobody's cutting off anything. First of all, people have access. People have access to the internet. But um, so we were able to get some updates on that on that whole Latin Grammys thing and how this is like an anti-racist movement. I feel like for anybody who before you partake in any of that propaganda, um, against against Cuba, against the Cuban Revolution, read some history. Under, learn and understand for yourself what the experience of African people was in Cuba prior to the Cuban Revolution. I want you to like go, go read uh, Gerald Horn's Race to Revolution. I want you to go watch a YouTube video about the Batista dictatorship. I want you to really understand because I had an opportunity to sit and hear from Black elders in Cuba who talked about the reality of being a black person in Cuba prior to the revolution and how they feel that they are taking their place. They have taken their place in society. And I want you to reckon with what happens if you allow yourself to be used as a tool against the Cuban revolution and by some chance, because I don't see it happening, but by some chance, the Cuban revolution is overcome or defeated. 
on the basis of some color revolution anti-racist agenda. I want you to understand how far back you are going to set Afro-Cuban, the Afro-Cuban people that you claim to care and want to advocate on behalf of, how far back you're going to set them, what that reality is going to look like. And then I want you to selfishly understand that we understand that um, African people across the world are in different stages of our revolutionary process. If you want, I want you to understand that Afro-Cubans are absolutely in an advanced stage to us, right? They've already won the right to health care, to free health care. They've already won, won the right to free education. They've already won a society in which they can participate democratically. So those, they've already won the right to housing. These are all things that in the U.S., African people, we don't fucking have homes. We don't own anything. We can't afford to go to school. We can't afford to see a doctor. They are in an advanced stage of their revolution. If you set them back, you're not only setting them back, you are setting yourself back because Cuba is one of the most important examples for African people that exist in the world today. We should all look to, to Cuba to Cuba with so much love and admiration and ask the question, what can we do to advance that struggle? Because when we advance the Cuban struggle, we advance our own struggle. And to work against the Re Cuban revolution is to work against yourself. I don't care how much you liberals claim to love black people <laughs> or claim to be anti-racist, anti-communism is never going to succeed. And so I say all that, I'm gonna wrap this up by saying, even though I posed all those hypotheticals just now about what would happen, what would happen if you set uh, Kubar back, I also want everybody to understand that you should think a little less of yourself because there's nothing that you're going to do that's going to cause the people of Cuba to give up on their revolution. They started it and they are determined to finish it. 60 years of the blockade has not, has not won. In 60 years of the blockade, they have not moved the needle. They are not going to move the needle. The Africans in Cuba, the non-Africans in Cuba, the women in Cuba, the disabled people in Cuba, the queer people in Cuba, all these segments of the population, they know, they know they're never giving that revolution up. And so at the end of the day, I want you to understand positionality. What can you do from where you are? If you care about women in Cuba, if you care about Africans in Cuba, if you care about disabled people in Cuba or whatever group of people that you're claiming to, claiming to want to advocate on behalf of in Cuba, if you care about them, support their path to revolution. That is all you can do from the United States. You will never change a policy position in Cuba. You will never change an economic decision. You will never make an economic decision in Cuba. Focus on your president, Joe Biden, and Vice President Kamala Harris, who have the power by executive order to end the blockade on Cuba any day now.